Thank you to CNI for accepting our program proposal and to all of you for watching. My name is Ann Okerson, connected to the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago. But during this half hour, the aim is to do something a little bit different. We're going to introduce the fledgling OLI or Offline Internet Consortium, particularly its mission and aspirations and to invite you to join in our work. While a growing number of individuals and communities are able to benefit in numerous ways from the expanded opportunities that new technologies offer, there are nonetheless many populations and regions where internet capabilities are weak to non-existent, resulting in the loss of educational, cultural, economic, research, and social development. Many data sources report that nearly half of the world does not have internet access, and many who do face significant limitations, including the extent and quality of content to be accessed. The idea for the OLI consortium was born at IFLA, which is the International Federation of Library Associations, at the World Congress in August 2017 in Rockwell, Poland, when some of us heard a presentation by Jeffrey Masley of the Sarawak State Library in Malaysia. Sarawak is located on the island of Borneo, which is the third largest island in the world. Internet broadband penetration in Sarawak is around 50%, and the digital gap between urban and rural areas is huge. Where private internet services are available, the cost is a barrier. Government-provided initiatives offer some relief, but the speed is very slow. Jeffrey and his colleagues presented their project called Pustaka in a Box, bridging, bridging the digital gap. Their solution was to set up a web server, a microcomputer Raspberry Pi with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capability. The setup easily holds about 50,000 eBooks and one unit of Pustaka costs $75 to set up. Our needs are minimal and testing in remote areas show this is an effective way of bridging the digital gap. A growing number of independent organizations and individuals are devoting efforts to solving the problem of access to digital information for underserved populations. While making enormous headway, such organizations are often unaware of other efforts, opportunities, and technical advances that could be leveraged. Inspired by the example of the Sarawak State Library, and in order to explore these issues and to pursue solutions, and through various serendipitous connections, the Arizona State University Library and the French-based Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, with the involvement of IFLA, brought together and organized two international summits in February 2018 and February 2020 at the ASU Library in Tempe, Arizona. In this session, we provide three short videos from three participating OLI members showing use cases and a very quick overview of technologies that they have developed. These technology-based groups are Solar Spell at ASU, the Ideas Box at the BSF in Paris, and Net Freedom Pioneers which is headquartered in California, but has offices in other parts of the world. After the presentations, Jim O'Donnell will say a little bit more about OLI and how we welcome partners and participants to join in this work, as well as an event we hope to hold later this year, which may be of interest. In a future edition of CNI, we could offer a deeper dive about some of the technologies being developed as our partners attempt to bring quality internet-like information to much of the world. Thank you for joining us. I had been traveling to and visiting schools across the developing world, trying to figure out why technology projects never seemed to work there. And one of the things that I kept seeing over and over again was this forward emphasis on technology and complete lack emphasis on the skills needed to use that technology. I became really passionate about figuring out how to offer better educational opportunities to kids who don't necessarily attend schools that have electricity, books, desks, the internet, etc. 
It may feel like the whole world is on the Internet, but less than half of the world's population has ever connected to the Internet. Technologists at Arizona State University took this as a challenge to come up with a kind of starter kit that could be put to use right away in remote parts of the world. Places that are still waiting for the infrastructure to connect to the Internet. Solar Spell was really an evolution of years of working in the developing worlds and seeing technology that both failed and succeeded. So how do we actually bring relevant educational materials to places that lack electricity, lack internet access, lack the basic infrastructures we're used to? I said, okay, in three months, we're going to build an offline, solar-powered, rugged, portable, digital library. Let's go. This is our familiar expensive laptop, and this is Solar Spell. This is not trying to be this. In a developing country where there's no place to plug in this expensive laptop, very soon this just becomes an expensive doorstop. Solar Spell has got a solar panel and a rechargeable battery inside, along with a library to learn from. So this is ready to go whether there's power or not. This costs about $200. This costs almost $3,000. We've seen a lot of projects where things are over-engineered and really fall apart very quickly when the Westerners leave. And so and seeing those, those projects and have worked on those projects, what we tried to do with Solar Spell is bring something that will just work when you when you take it there. And once we leave, it'll continue to work and work and perform as we envisioned it so that extreme durability and reliability is what we need because we can't be in those really real places when something doesn't work right. So what happens when these things get to where they're finally going? Well, that solar panel on the back is ready to start charging up the battery, but the battery is shipped already charged. So a parent, a student, a teacher just plugs in a couple of cables. This throws up a Wi-Fi signal, and it's already preloaded with lots to learn. One of the greater challenges for me is to convince people that this project is not about this cute, shiny box that we're bringing to the field and that it's not an, an inexpensive, you know, cheap piece of technology that you can throw over the fence and forget about. It's a library. Mentally, people are, are hungry for information and this is a great way to get safe, relevant educational information to people. So one of the beauties of Solar Spell being at Arizona State University is we do have a large, diverse student body that is interested in working on projects that really benefit education in the developing world. And with Solar Spell, there's always improvements that we can make, both in the software and the hardware design. This is actually a process I came to realize, and there is so much value from going to the field, sometimes from failing, but the most important thing is that you actually make time to reflect and learn from the things that didn't go right and figure out what it is that you want to make right the next time or work to make better. The university students help build each solar spell unit and as part of coursework they also help refine and improve solar spell. The units you see them building here will ship out in a few weeks but already there's a newer better design which is what the student teams will help put together on the next build day. We assemble a team of students and give them a real world challenge that's focused on you know, a project that our partners in the field have identified as a need that they have. And I tell the students, okay, we're gonna work really hard on this problem for a whole semester, and then you're gonna come with me at the end of the day or at the end of the semester and deliver this to our partners in the field. We're gonna look them in the eye and we're gonna say, all right, this is the best that we could do from on campus. Now work with us and help us make it better for you. From a design standpoint, we really have four key areas that we look at. We've got the solar spell from an industrial design standpoint itself and what the package looks like. The second is the electrical engineering design that goes into the solar spell. The third is the computer science side that makes the Raspberry Pi startup as a Wi-Fi access point and provide this offline website. And the fourth is the user interface design and designing for that first time user. And all of those areas, we have about 50 students every semester involved in all four of those design areas improving solar spell and enhancing it 
And so every semester we do challenge students with both ideas that are kind of out there and ones that are really needed to support our, our, our students and teachers in the field. And so we always want to have a balance of what can be done. Basically, one of the long stories short is that if you give students the right incentive, they always come through. Every single time we go to the field, we identify new challenges. So the initiative will never be over because the hardware of the library, the content of the library, the software, the training that we do with teachers, every single part of that can be approved and we work to improve it every time we go to the field. More than half of the world's population does not have access to the internet, either because they lack the electricity or coverage to access internet, or because internet data is too expensive. At Libraries Without Borders, we know that vulnerabilities are exacerbated when people lack access to the information they need to make decisions. When a disaster strikes, it is crucial to have access to emergency information, which could include where to find shelter, how to adapt to current sanitary conditions, and how to reconnect with family. Later on, it's time for psychological reconstruction and starting up emergency schools. What if we could bring the internet offline, bring libraries to where they are most needed, even when there is no internet and no electricity? For this, Libraries Without Borders has created an offline digital library, the Coon Book. The Coon Book is a battery operated device that streams video content, documents, images, and digital courses using an integrated Wi Fi hotspot. These contents are tailored to each location and disaster type so that they are in the right language and adapted to local needs and cultures. This library is organized in packages such as health information, maps, or even activities to help children process trauma. These contents are then preloaded on a hard drive and accessed via the browser of a tablet, telephone, or computer. It has been successfully used in health clinics, libraries, schools, and community centers throughout the world. Its compact format makes it a highly flexible tool that can be transported anywhere. It is both replicable and shareable. The Coombook is fully documented in open source user guides. You can build it yourself, or it can be completely assembled by us. The Coombook comes in a kit that extends its functionalities, making it a turnkey solution. Let's see a quick presentation. The Coombook is a quite simple device to use. It has one push button in the front and two plugs at the rear of the casing. One plug is used to power up the device and the other one is a Ethernet cable that can connect the Coombook to the Ethernet. It's simple to start. You press the push button for two seconds, then wait for the LED to flash. Once it's done, just grab a tablet, a smartphone, or a laptop to connect to the Wi Fi hotspot and browse the IT screen portal. In some use cases, you may want to extend the Wi Fi coverage with an external antenna. This antenna covers a Wi-Fi area up to 200 meters and can host around 50 people depending on the usage. Thanks to a solar kit, we can use a battery and a foldable solar panel. This solar panel can charge the battery. Once it's done, you can use the battery to power a few tablets, the combo, or for the Wi-Fi antenna. The set of devices is what we call the combo kit. It's easy to assemble. And in the next step, we are going to see through a demo how it works.
The Hades box is a media center in a kit. It's basically composed of four boxes. Inside of these boxes, you will find physical contents, books, games, uh, creative materials, musical instruments, cameras, these kind of things, but also tablets, computers. You have a server in one of these box, and in this server, you will find uh, thousands of resources, digital resources that are carefully selected. The Hades box is more than a tool. It's a concept that transforms a space into a cultural information hub, a social hub also, where people can meet, exchange, debate. People that go to the Hades box can also uh, receive training in this space. So it's a very multi-sectoral space that can be used in many different contexts, such as the humanitarian context of Bangladesh. <laughs> the idea is really to, uh, to continue with a step-by-step -step approach to provide tools as uh, people are also evolving with us uh, and integrate these new tools, these new technologies such as tablets, uh, for instance, so they can connect to the server, access the digital resources that we selected. With this step-by-step -step approach, we hope to reach uh, a great impact uh, and also to increase mobilization and participation in the project that we run with, uh, with our different partners. Our world is connected. But accessing information is a daily struggle for many people around the globe. Forget cat videos and selfies. Families are disconnected from accessing health, education, and valuable knowledge that could make a big difference. Communities with limited infrastructure, in remote locations, under government censorship, or those who simply can't afford their internet bill are left in the dark. That's where Knapsack for Hope comes in. Knapsack for Hope's technology brings curated online content to users all over the globe through satellite TV. Satellite TV is more common and less expensive than internet service and works in even the most remote locations. Our curator team gathers the best and most requested entertainment and educational files from around the web and bundles it into a digital knapsack. The knapsack is then encoded into discrete, untraceable video files that are broadcast via satellite to a small local dish. Anyone with a satellite receiver, USB stick, and the knapsack application can easily record, transfer, decode, and view the content on their laptop or smartphone. This way, more information is more accessible to more people for free. And what's possible when information is freely accessible to everyone? Anything.
El Sol y la Luna aparentan tener más o menos el mismo tamaño del cielo, aunque eso es solo gracias a la coincidencia. Pues implosionó mi, mi cabeza, hizo que estallara. Vi mucho potencial en la, en la tecnología y dije, esto tiene que conocerlo la, la, la población. Eh, el, el desarrollo ya está hecho, ya está probado. Eh, incluimos un programa oficial, una iniciativa por parte del, del gobierno federal eh, en materia educativa. Es importante que el acceso a esta plataforma que se aprende 2.0 está disponible en Internet. Eh, pero aquí, al menos en, en, en Álvaro Obregón, o en Cochita, en Oaxaca, los chicos nunca han tenido Internet. Entonces, ¿cómo va a ser posible que ellos accedan a, a este contenido? Es donde entramos nosotros. En este laboratorio de cómputo, pues los chicos vienen a, a aprender un poco de informática. Eh, contamos con 12 computadoras aproximadamente. La estación de contenido es este pequeño ordenador, el cual se pues, encarga de almacenar y, y compartir el contenido eh, que hemos recopilado para los chicos, todo el contenido académico. Trabaja en conjunto con una antena de banda KU y un pequeño dispositivo Wi-Fi que sirve para que los chicos puedan conectarse desde su smartphone, desde su tablet. NASPAC, entonces, pues nos, eso ya nos dio un aliciente, por lo menos, ¿no? Porque precisamente lo que nosotros queríamos era algo donde los muchachos consultaran, pero consultaran algo que sí valiera la pena, algo documental, algo histórico, algo... Eh, no, no meterse a internet nada más por el simple hecho de ir a chatear, ir a... ¿no? Sino que más bien que nos sirva para lo, la cuestión educativa. Pues. Y pues esto nos cayó como, pues, del cielo, ¿no? Knapsack for Hope. Connectivity without borders. Join the information liberation today. Howdy. My name is Jim O'Donnell. I'm the university librarian at Arizona State University, and I'm happy to round out this program about the offline internet consortium. We've just seen reports from colleagues working the offline internet space around the world. What they have in common is technical ingenuity, engineering skill, and deep commitment to bringing to the underserved the best of what the internet makes available to people in privileged regions. There are in fact dozens of organizations working at various levels in various ways to find how to give access to those without. Perhaps the most surprising approach we've had in our consortium came from an association of theological schools looking to provide a core library to seminaries in Africa. There are countless needs like that. In fact, there are many places, geographical places, and what I might call social places, where the internet does not yet reach. Official estimates suggest half the people on the planet fall into those zones, but in some ways the numbers are even higher. In some countries, for example, something of the internet is available, but censorship cripples it. In others, like the United States, networking in major cities is ubiquitous, many people cannot afford a data plan sufficient to their needs and do not have the experience to become savvy users of what they are able to access. So the kinds of places where offline internet has an opportunity to make a contribution include at least geographically remote locations, socially disadvantaged locations where networking infrastructure is inadequate or overpriced, politically disadvantaged locations where self-serving politicians obstruct the search for knowledge. Post-disaster situations where normal facilities are out of service and post-conflict situations where refugees find themselves on the run or in camps where connectivity is impossible. What's inspiring about working with the Offline Internet Consortium is to see the passion and ingenuity that our friends and colleagues are bringing to remedy these conditions. What you see behind me is the homepage of the Offline Internet Consortium with a very simple URL, I'll repeat it later, but it's offline-internet.org. The email address internet.unplugged at gmail.com will reach the steering committee. We welcome inquiries of every kind. If you're working in this space as a provider of service, or would like to know how to become one, we'll be glad to talk with you. But if like that theological association, 
you have a problem reaching an audience that needs information you curate, we can connect to your likely partners. And I should emphasize that the underserved populations are literally everywhere. The videos you have seen take us to traditional sites of human development on other continents. But we at Arizona State University are engaged in these issues in part because the Native American communities in our own state have their own struggles. As we've more than found out last year, when lockdown drove students back to homes on the reservations, where getting a Zoom connection proved impossible. The State Library of Arizona is working with those communities. Our colleagues at Bibliothèque Sans Frontières have worked with the urban poor by finding ways to meet at neighborhood laundromats, a nearly ideal place to find people with some time on their hands and curiosity to spare. In coordinating the work of innovators and practitioners from around the world, we hope to support development of technology, broader implementation, and ultimately greater funding support for these efforts. In our last group meeting, we identified a vision and strategy for advancing our mission. For a first step, we look not only for new partners and users, but for the most efficient way to support creation of a nucleus of a small secretariat that can coordinate the work and advance the outreach to funders, whether those be private, governmental, or NGO. If you are impressed by what you've seen here today, and if you can help us in any of these ways, if you want to participate in this consortium, please join us. We'll make it easy. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for enjoying this presentation with us.